Okay. Well, let's begin. Uh, welcome. Uh, so uh, I'd like to go over the course outline, uh, and then my goal today is get to get through about half of chapter one. Uh, so um, good, I don't have to learn any names. So you've all had, had me before, or you may have me again uh, for other classes. So uh, welcome, hope you had a good break. Um, so uh, my office is right downstairs, so please uh, come by. It's just before this class uh, for, for some office hours. Um, so I'm actually in there from 10 to 2, so uh, if you have any questions, um, just come by if the door's open. If not, uh, just knock on the door. You're welcome to come in. Um, so class days, so uh, we're kind of hitting the start of the semester in the middle of the week, so hope you got the email about no labs uh, this week. Uh, so we'll start lab next week. So you'll, you'll either be in Monday or Wednesday uh, from 12.50 to 1.50. So, um, uh, so that'll be in, in 1.34. So same, same lab uh, room as kinesiology will be down there. So um, lots of good labs this semester with the force plate, uh, with jump mats, with the Tendo Vitrodyne, a lot, just lots of different assessments. Um, biomechanics is more about numbers than kinesiology. Um, I'm not a mathematician or a physicist, uh, but biomechanics is, is more objective. So uh, we do some very simple calculations, basic algebra, uh, as well as trigonometry. So most of the, the math, uh, I think will be well within your realm. Um, we'll do some very simple things today just to uh, illustrate concepts from the chapter. Um, so uh, you'll need a basic scientific calculator. So if you have one from high school even, dust it off and just bring it in. Um, doesn't need to be a graphing calculator that's like $100, just um, like used for other classes just uh, as long as it has the sine cosine and tangent functions you're fine um, so you'll use this for uh, exams and class problems um, anything else okay so um, I do use the book a lot uh, it's a very good book um, I've gone with this book for several years now um, but a really good author um, he's I've actually had a few questions and have emailed him, and um, he's actually very good at getting back. So he uh, writes really well for just basic biomechanics. Um, he focuses a lot on the, the applied aspects. So I think most of us here are going to be practitioners, which so that's what we need, right? Um, we don't want a lot of the information we can't use. So. Um, the reason I like this book is it gives us a lot of applications that we can apply with real world stuff. So um, if I know uh, there is an expense and I understand that, I was a student once. Um, so if you wanna buy a book, like between two or three of you, that's fine. Um, but we, just so you know, we will be using the book. You'll need to have access uh, one way or another for that. Um, okay, so. Really, if I was to summarize this class in one word, it would be force. So we talk all about uh, what happens with force application. Uh, we talk about lots of different forces that are applied to an object or body. Um, we talk about instantaneous force. We talk about average force, uh, what happens with force over time, uh, impulse, momentum, work, power, energy. Uh, and then at the very end of the semester, we get into some fun uh, applications with fluid mechanics. So that's uh, objects or bodies in uh, air and water. So uh, if we look at the schedule, uh, I like to take about two class periods on each chapter. Um, so we'll take today and Monday, cover chapter one, um, and you can see and so on. So. Looking down to torque, that's Dr. Snyder's favorite chapter. How many have had Dr. Snyder for physics? Many will have, okay. Dr. Snyder loves to study torques and 
So sometimes I invite him for chapter five just because he enjoys it so much. So he may be on the back row. So you can see exams are generally about uh, two chapters each. Um, we do have review activities, uh, study guides, um, but you do need to make sure you have your calculator. Um, you may need this piece of scratch paper too for exams. So chapter six, seven, angular motion versus linear motion. We'll talk about the difference. And then effects of water and air. So those are really interesting chapters. And then the mechanics of biological materials. So mechanics of tissues that make up your body, like muscle, bones, and ligaments and tendons. So we'll talk about all of that. Uh, the final is uh, comprehensive, mostly emphasizing chapter nine, but there is some selected comprehensive concepts. So um, what you need to do is just look at the study guide to know what the comprehensive stuff is. And so amazing how fast semesters go by, uh, but we'll just work our way progressively through. Do you have any questions? Okay. some football physics here in a little bit. Okay, so forces. Um, so in this chapter, we'll define what a force is. We're going to um, classify different forces, including friction and weight. So if you don't know the answer to a question, chances are the answer is gravity. So gravity, gravity, gravity. We talk all about gravity. So you need to get used to the idea that the force of gravity and weight are the same thing. So because what, what gives our bodies weight? What's the answer? Gravity. Gravity, right. Okay, so then we'll determine the result of two or more forces. So when you have multiple forces acting on a body or object, uh, the outcome is dependent on the direction of the resultant, the point of application of the resultant. So at the very end of this chapter, we get into a little bit of trigonometry where uh, we take multiple forces acting on a body or object and determine the outcome. So what's the overall force out of potentially many forces uh, acting on a body or object? So in this, in this chapter, maybe some of your other, other classes, um, we use the metric system. So the international system of units. So looking at that map, um, the United States is pretty unique in the world. The, we use the imperial system a lot of the time. So pounds and inches and feet, uh, whereas most of the rest of the world uses the, the metric system. So, we will follow that because in science, uh, especially in, in leading research and conducting research, um, most of the, if, if you go on to publish something, most of the journals require uh, metric units. Um, so we'll go over conversion factors and how you go from a pound to a newton and so on. Okay, so what are forces? So a force subjectively can be defined as a push or a pull. Pretty easy, right? So you push and you pull. Pretty simple. So forces, if we go deeper into that, um, it's mechanical energy that causes displacement of a body or object. So that mechanical energy is generated from our muscles. So we convert caloric energy into mechanical energy. So the food that we eat is used to fuel our muscles that produce uh, contraction that is expressed uh, through our limbs as external force production. So the most familiar unit uh, in the United States is the pound. Okay, so this class, I'd like you to get used to using the SI unit for force is the Newton. The Newton, so named after the late 1600s mathematician Isaac Newton. So we'll go over of course, Newton's laws in chapter three. Okay, so one Newton is equal to, to the force required to accelerate a one kilogram mass 
mass, one meter per second squared. So two different variables there. Uh, mass is expressed in kilograms. Uh, acceleration is expressed as meters per second squared. So in other words, one kilogram multiplied by one meters per, per second squared uh, is equal to one uh, Newton. So anything that has to do with force, gravity, and since gravity is equal to our weight, our weight is going to be expressed in Newtons. So one Newton is equal to point zero point two two five pounds. One pound is equal to four point four four five Newtons. So your Newtons is a lot greater than your pounds. So we'll go over how to um, some other factors that, that go into that equation and calculating weight later on in this chapter. Okay, so forces come in pairs. So in chapter three, we'll study Newton's third law, which is uh, the law of uh, equal and opposite forces, okay, the law of action-reaction. And so looking at a practical example, forces, force pairs are equal in size, but act in opposite directions on each body or object. So the law of action reaction. Now, the forces themselves are equal and opposite, but the effect of each force in that interaction depends on an object or body's mass. So let's take a look. So this person is applying a downward force okay, to a pull-up bar. Okay, so the hands are applying a downward force to the bar what does the bar do? It applies an equal and oppositely directed force, which is what brings the body up to the bar. So something else we have to consider, the red arrow there is the body's weight. Okay, so in order for that body to go up, the reactive force from the bar has to be greater than the body's weight. Does that make sense? So you have, really you have two competing forces. You have the sum of the reactive force from the bar. That's positive, right? So now we're defining forces as positive or negative. So you have the reactive force from the bar, which is the sum of these two in yellow. And that's positive, and then you have the downward force from her weight. So weight is expressed with a negative sign because what direction does gravity act on our body mass? It acts down, right? So the force of gravity acting on the mass of our body is what creates weight, and so weight is, is negative in the negative direction because it, it's gravity acting on our body. So in order to successfully complete a pull-up, the sum of the reactive force has to be greater than the weight. So to extend this principle into kinesiology, right? So if the reactive force is greater than weight, what type of muscle action will we have? Concentric because we're lifting. So the reactive force is greater than weight. Okay, so I think we have up and we have down. So if the reactive force is winning the battle, the body is going to go up. If the reactive force is losing the battle, the body is going to come back down. Okay, so concentric, eccentric actions has to do with this competition between the reactive force, as, as we have a reactive force uh, from the bar, and then the downward effect of gravity on our body mass. So forces are things that cause acceleration. So a change in the state of an object or body, whether 
either starting, stopping, speeding up, slowing down, or changing direction. All of these things are defined as acceleration. So we're changing the state of the body. We're initiating motion. So we apply a downward force to the bar, and the reactive force from the bar is greater than our weight, and so the body goes up. Okay, so forces are vectors. So what's the name of this guy? Any of you admit that you've seen the movie? Yeah, what's his name? Vector, right? Because he's committing crimes with what? Magnitude and direction, right? So you need to remember, anytime you have a vector quantity, it's going to have magnitude, that's size, and it's also going to have direction. So the mass of your body is going to have a certain weight, but the direction is going to be downward. So up and to the right, are typically defined as positive. So we'll just simplify this and we'll say up to the right, we'll say for this class that's, that's our positive direction. Down and to the left, typically defined as, as negative as far as forces go. So force is one example of a vector. So all that means is we're going to have a certain amount of force and that force is going to be in a specified direction. So other things that are that are forces. Uh, acceleration is another example. So we can have positive acceleration where an object or body is speeding up. We can have negative acceleration, which negative acceleration is sometimes called deceleration, where an object or body is uh, slowing down. So we'll go over several examples of velocity and displacement and so on. So, so just remember magnitude and direction. So characteristics of a force. So it's going to have a size, have a direction. So sometimes direction and sense. If you see the word sense, it just means direction in any chapter. Uh, point of application. So that, that makes a huge difference. Where exactly on an object or body is a force being applied. So that's typically designated with an arrow point. So forces are uh, graphically represented by arrows. So we, we make free body diagrams as part of this class. So in solving a problem, you might want to draw a diagram. Um, to help you visualize what's going on, to keep track of all the different forces. Um, so the length of the arrow represents the force magnitude. So how much force you have, larger forces would be longer uh, arrows. The arrowhead uh, indicates the force sense or direction. The shaft of the arrow indicates the line of application. And then one end of the arrow indicates the point of application on an object or body. So arrows are used a lot with uh, just drawing out different problems. Okay, so forces acting on a shot putter, right, ladies? Yeah. So we have equal and opposite forces, remember? So we have the force from the shot putter acting on the shot, and then we have an equal and opposite force for the shot applied back from the shot putter. So based on our discussion so far, or maybe thinking about this scenario, what other forces do we have that are not depicted in that diagram? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gravity. <laughs> And gravity is equal to what? A body's weight. Yes, so we always have weight. Yeah, so weight is definitely in there. What about, do these athletes wear special shoes? Yeah, why do you wear special shoes for a shot putter? 
Okay, so you're, you just said it. Friction is another force, right? So that has a lot to do with the force that acts between the bottom of your feet and, and the ground. So we're getting to friction later on. But yeah, so there's more forces that complicate this problem overall. What is the outcome? Okay. So we want to project that shot as far as possible. So how can we optimize or control all the forces that are acting on this body or object to, to make that happen? So we talked a lot about that. All right, so let's classify forces. So first classification of forces, uh, internal. So inside our body, in other words, forces that are inside our body. So these are forces that affect a specific part of the body. So they don't affect the body as a whole. They just affect the specific part. So we have three of those examples, tension, uh, compression, and shear. And those three are all internal forces inside, inside of our bodies. So let's take a look at a few examples. So tension is sometimes called uh, tensile. And so we have tendons, these big Achilles tendon, okay, that pulls on the calcaneal tuberosity, okay, and that causes plantar flexion. So pulling type forces are, are tensile forces. So tendons pulling on their attachment points uh, is the best example of tensile forces in our bodies. Okay, compression. So compression is opposite of tension. So tension, you think pulling apart. Compression is the opposite. It's pushing together, right? So this is the most common force that we have inside our bodies, uh, mainly due to gravity. Okay, so gravity is always acting on us externally, but that creates compression uh, internally. Um, these forces are a good thing within limits. So we need these forces. We need gravity. Uh, what happens if people like astronauts are in an anti-gravity environment? What happens to their tissues over time? They tend to atrophy. Reduction in bone mineral density and, and muscles and so on. So. These forces are a good thing, but within limits. Uh, so if we exceed those limits, that's when we get these uh, problems. So in this case, we have a compression fracture. You can see there. Um, we can also get bulging discs due to compression, which then places pressure on these uh, nerve roots. So we shouldn't we shouldn't think of these forces as a bad thing. When we exercise, we place elevated amounts of these forces, but what's the intent of exercise? We're elevating forces beyond our normal daily activities, but what's the idea? With exercise, we, we're strengthening our tissues, aren't we? So that's kind of the principle of overload. So that's a fundamental principle of exercise is we overload the body beyond which our body's accustomed to. And then over time, we can strengthen these tissues like bones and muscles and tendons. Okay, so shear forces, these are parallel type uh, forces. So gravity acts on our spine and we want to keep our spine in neutral. That means we have preservation of the normal curves of the spine. So our low back right here, our lumbar spine, has just a little bit of curvature to it. And so as gravity acts on the spine, 
we have two parts of that force. Some of that force from gravity is acting, let's see, is acting as a shear force. Okay, so that's that's tending to slide the vertebrae. Okay, another part is acting as a compressive force. And our bodies are pretty good at dealing with compression. They're not as good. Our tissues are, don't have as much tolerance to uh, shear forces. So, and then tension is kind of in the middle. So as, as far as tolerance goes, compression, tension, and then uh, shear is what, what our tissues have the least amount of tolerance to in terms of producing injuries and so on. So if we have more of, of an arch, so our, our low back is more hyperextended, you can see that we're getting less compression, but we're getting more of this shear type force. So shear forces are a key factor in causing disc herniations. So this is why it's so important to strengthen the muscles around this area. Okay, so sometimes we call those the core muscles around this area because that allows us to keep this nice neutral spine. So as we do different exercises, squats and Romanian deadlifts and all those things, we want preservation of that neutral spine. So this segment is, is locked in neutral through muscle activation and then it's a pivoting action at the hip. So everything here is isometric. So this is one segment that's locked in neutral where we're safest and then all the pivoting takes place about the hip. So if we're getting an excessive amount of arch in our low back here, that's really not good. That's a lot of stress on those discs uh, due to the shear uh, type force. Okay, so another classic example is uh, shear force at uh, the knee joint. So uh, this is Brian Schilling, uh, University of Memphis. And uh, he, and a, he and a colleague at University of Memphis did a study where they looked at stress on different parts of the body uh, with unrestricted forward knee movement. In other words, this would be where the knee is under a greater amount of shear stress versus over here where there was actually a piece of plywood. Can you see the, the plywood that was placed here? which restricted uh, forward movement of the knee joint. So it's, it's really interesting what they found. So the first thing what I'd like to ask you to do is to kind of break this up. I'd like you to click on this link and it's just, it's like a one page article. It's really short. And I'd like you to read it quickly about two minutes and then we'll get back together and talk about it. should be able to just click on it and it will we'll open up here. So this is a pretty good article published here on the Physio Network. So is it safe for knees to pass the toes during a squat? Take a few minutes, read through it.
We need a little more time. Hey, what'd you think? Is there anything? Yeah. So if you're an Olympic lifter, think about your catch position on an Olympic lift. You're going to be pretty deep into a full squat if you're an Olympic lifter, so you have to be trained that way. Um, what is excessive forward knee movement? Did you catch that part? I think it was at 15 to 20 centimeters, so that's like six to eight inches. So that seems to be pretty excessive. So if, if you have pre-existing knee issues, what were some of the options to limit forward movement or we say forward translation of the knee joints? Yeah, so type of squat. So remember the order, it was something like, so the front squat, which is really kind of like the catch position for an Olympic lift, uh, results in the most anterior knee translation, followed by what the high bar back squat, Low bar back squat, and then what was the fourth one? Mm -hmm. yeah, the box squat. So, um, if you have pre existing knee issues, uh, probably best to limit forward translation of the knee joints. But if you're an Olympic lifting competitor that's part of the sport, or if you have you know, completely healthy knees and you enjoy squatting, uh, the knee joints are able to tolerate that type of stress. So it's, you can't look at everything as an either or scenario. So everything is relative um, and adapted to the individual. Um, so if we are limiting forward knee movement completely, where does all the stress go then? Hips and low back. Yeah, hips and low back. So that can create, potentially create other problems. So uh, just, just kind of keeping everything in perspective that compression, tension, and shear are part of normal activity part of normal exercise activities. It's just trying to keep those forces within safe limits is, is really the key. And for some people, um, their limits are gonna be a lot higher than other people. Okay, so if someone already has pre-existing knee issues, then their tolerance for shear stress is gonna be a lot less than someone who's, who doesn't. So if you restrict uh, forward knee movement, you will decrease knee torque by 22%, but <laughs> you're increasing hip and low back torque by a lot more. So I don't think the trade-off is worth it. It doesn't seem like it. Okay, so uh, internal forces. These are forces that can't change the position of our bodies. 
So once the body has left the ground and, and is in flight, we can't change our body position. We can flail our arms and flail our legs, but we can't move our center of mass from one position to another. So that'd be the case here of the, the defender here. So we're only able to change our position if we're able to interact with an external body or object. So in this case, this person can't change their position until they come back down and are able to push from the ground or from the pony. So, 1988, February 1988, NBA slam dunk competition. Uh, so you have this battle going on between Dominique Wilkins of the Atlanta Hawks, who was the champion in 1987, and Michael Jordan. And um, so this was an epic, epic battle. So it all came down to the very last dunk. And so there's a still frame of that dunk. So uh, Michael Jordan jumped from the foul line and successfully completed the dunk, got 50 out of 50 points, and won the dunk competition. But if you're able, ever able to Google that competition, 1988 slam dunk competition, it's probably one of the best dunk competitions ever between uh, Dominic Wilkins and, and Michael Jordan. So Michael Jordan's flight time on this dunk from time to lift off to back to the ground was 0.94 seconds. So 0.94 seconds, almost a whole second from the time he took off to the time he came back down. So in analyzing this flight, uh, Michael Jordan was either going up or coming back down. So, in other words, half of that time, half of that 0.94 seconds was spent going up, and the other half was spent going from his peak position in the flight back down to the ground. So there's really no pause button in the middle of a jump, even though the optical illusion of jumping makes it look like it because he stretches his arms and legs in flight. But a jumper is either going up or coming back down. And because we know what acceleration of gravity is, um, it's going to be one half time is spent going up, the other half is spent coming back down. So his, his vertical leap was around 45 inches. Um, which you have to have that kind of vertical leap in order to dunk from the foul line, which I think is what, about 16 feet from the foul line to the front of the rim. So it probably also would have been a good long jumper. <laughs> I've never seen any records of him actually trying a long jump. It be, would have been interesting to see how he did. But, um, okay, so let's talk about this. What factors affect, affect flight path or trajectory? during a jump. So if, if your objective is to jump as high as possible, in this case you have to jump high and far. Let's say that your objective though is to jump just as high as you possibly can, like a vertical jump test. What factors would you consider to be important? Yes, of course. So the amount of force affects your takeoff velocity. So the more velocity that you have, instantaneous velocity that you have at takeoff, the higher you're going to go or the farther you're going to go. So how do you, how do you control whether you go high or whether you go far? What's another factor besides force and takeoff velocity? Yes, good, very good. So takeoff angle and takeoff velocity. So if you want to go as high as possible, what should your takeoff angle be relative to the ground? Yes, or what would that angle be? Yeah, 90 degrees, right? So straight up and straight back down. So you don't want any horizontal application of force into the ground at all because that's wasted effort. So you want to pretty much land in the same place you took off from, right? So then what if your objective, like in this case, where you'd also need to jump far, what would your optimal takeoff angle be? In theory, in, in theory, if you want to jump just as far as possible, 
say not in this case, but with a standing broad jump, what would be your optimal takeoff angle? What would you hypothesize or guess? 45, why would you say that? That's absolutely correct. Yeah. So you have a little bit of both, right? So for a standing broad jump, what if your takeoff angle is too flat? Yeah, you're not gonna stay in the air long enough, right? What if your takeoff angle is too high? Yeah, you're not gonna move forward, it's right. So 45 degrees. Now, we will watch some video later on, comes up in chapter two, where the optimal takeoff angle for elite long jumpers is about 18 degrees. And so what they say is that with a lower takeoff angle, you're able to get a higher takeoff velocity, which seems to be the more important factor for jumping really far. So usually an elite long jumper is also very fast. Um, so take Carl Lewis, for example, who held the world record at one time in the 100 meters. He was also a very good long jumper. Okay, so going on from internal forces to external forces. So these are forces outside our body. So we have a couple of examples. Uh, contact, contact versus non-contact. So contact is with an object that is external to our bodies, whereas non-contact are external forces that affect our bodies but are not due to tangible masses. So to talk about non-contact, we're, we're talking about things like gravity, uh, magnetic, and electrical forces. So for this class, the only one that we talk about in detail is, is gravity. The, the only non-contact external force that's relevant to our study here is, is gravity. So the force of gravity, like we said, defined as the weight of an object or body. The weight of an object or body. So what units do we express the force of gravity or an object's weight? What are the units for force in the SI system? Newtons. Newtons. Yes, Newtons. Sorry. So the force of gravity accelerates object or bodies at a rate of negative 9.81 meters per second squared. So if we go to the imperial system, that's negative 9.81 meters per second squared is equal to negative 32.2 feet per second squared. So later on today, when we watch the physics of football presentation, the professor will use 32.2 feet per second squared. So just know that he's using that, but it's equal to 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay, so on Earth, uh, our mass, we define mass as substance. Okay, the substance that makes up our bodies uh, is measured in kilograms. Mass is not a vector quantity. So we, we call it a scalar, S-C-A-L-A-R, a scalar quantity. So we want to know how much mass but we don't define direction with that. So mass is, is substance. So weight and mass are proportional to each other by a factor of 9.81. So the force of gravity acting on our object's mass is equal to our weight. So here's the formula right here. So weight or the force of gravity, okay, is equal to your mass in kilograms multiplied by negative 9.81 meters per second squared. So to simplify it sometimes, and I'll tell you when you can do this, you can just round that up to negative 10 and it makes it really easy. So say, um, you have a weight of 225 pounds, which would be equal to 100 kilograms. Okay, so 100 kilograms multiplied by negative 10. 
100 kilograms multiplied by negative 10 is equal to what? Hundred times ten is what? Thousand. Yeah, thousand. So it'd be negative one thousand newtons, or just under that. Okay, ne negative nine hundred and eighty-one newtons to be precise. So weight is the force of gravity acting on the mass of a body or object. So sometimes gra uh, gravitational forces are expressed in units called G's, capital G. So one G is equal to our body weight. So three G's is equal to three times our body weight. So biomechanists uh, studying forces that are acting on a body or object will oftentimes look at how many multiples of an individual's body weight is, is acting on their body at an instant in time. So once you take out a sheet of paper, we're gonna do just a few practice problems. Very simple, super simple just to get you working with these numbers. So this is from 2006, but I just checked recently, and I guess this is at least the source I looked at. This is still the record. So um, when offensive lineman Aaron Gibson reported to the Buffalo Bills in 2006, he was the largest NFL player ever with a mass of 186 kilograms. What was Aaron's weight in newtons? So what's your equation for weight? Mass multiplied by what? Yeah, negative 9.81 meters per second squared. So you could easily convert that to pounds, right? In some of your other classes, maybe you took the mass and multiplied by 2.2, and so in this case, you'd come up with over 400 pounds. That's a pretty, pretty big guy. Can you imagine a guy that size with that speed? What'd you get for Newtons though? 1,824. Yeah, 824. Is it negative or positive? Negative. Negative, why? Gravity. gravity. Yes, gravity and weight are synonymous. Okay, a couple more. At the 2008 Beijing Olympics, Matthias Steiner of Germany won the gold medal in weightlifting in the unlimited weight class. So that's over 105 kilograms. He lifted 203 kilograms in the snatch, 258 kilograms in the clean and jerk, for a total of 461 kilograms. So how much does 461 kilograms weigh in newtons? The same process as before. And something? 4,524. Yep. yep. And again, it's, it's positive or negative? Negative. Negative, correct. Because it's weight. So weight is always expressed negatively. Okay, just a little bit different spin on things here. So a fitness instructor weighs negative 600 newtons. What is her mass? Just use your basic algebra to. Solve for the mass in kilograms. So to solve for this one, you divide negative 600 by what number? 
negative 9.81 to get the mass in kilograms. What did you come up with for kilos? 50 or 60? Right in there, 61. So everybody good so far? Everybody know what weight is? All right. Okay, so let's watch this little video clip. G's in contact sports. So G's are multiples of our body weight. And there's a lot of them in contact sports. Looks like that hit on Golden Gopher wide receiver Eric Decker didn't feel too good. The blast from Cal safety Sean Catoose had enough force to cut Decker's jaw open. And while Decker clearly was uncomfortable after the hit, the Gopher athletic staff was able to stitch him up so he could head back into the game. Which is amazing considering the force his body was stood. Just to hold on to that ball is a testament to the hand strength of Eric Decker. But hold on a minute. Just how much force did Decker endure? How hard was that hit? How many G's did Decker experience during that hit? We will find that answer. We took University of Minnesota physics professor Dan Dahlberg out to the TCF Bank Stadium field to break down the science behind Decker's amazing touchdown catch. Knowing the time and the distance where he landed, I can now calculate what that velocity was. To find those numbers, Dahlberg first had to study some film. Using the game footage, he was able to break down the play in several different ways, coming up with estimated speeds of Decker, Katoos, the impact, and the time it took for both players to land. Next comes the math. And so that acceleration that he was experiencing was 345 feet per second squared. Known factors like Decker's speed in the 40-yard dash and the time it took for him to travel between the 10 and 5-yard lines, which was determined by watching the video, Dahlberg was able to come up with an equation that allowed him to estimate the amount of g-force exerted on Decker's body during the brief impact. And the key to doing that was determining the distance between where Decker was hit to where he landed on the ground. So in terms of g's, I want to take this 345 feet per second squared and divide that by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 32 feet per second squared. And when we do this, we find that his acceleration was 10.7 Gs. To be precise, Dahlberg says Decker felt 10.78 Gs of force during the hit. Now that 345 feet per second squared divided by 32 feet per second squared, which is the force of one G, gravity, and that's how you get 10.78. 10.78 G is a force that Decker suddenly felt during that hit. Now, that's a pretty big number. I found one report online where Navy carrier pilots undergo an acceleration of about three Gs when they take it off from the catapults and sits on the flight. Uh, in car wrecks, it looked like you could have as much as 40 Gs. To give you some idea, that's 10.7 Gs. And then if Decker weighs, say, 200 pounds, right at that point during that collision, he's weighing more than a ton. Standing on the field with no other forces factored in, Eric Decker weighs 220 pounds. For a brief moment during the impact, Decker had 10.78 Gs thrusting him. 10.78 times 220 is more than 2,300, which means for that brief impact, Decker felt like he weighed 2,300 pounds. That's more than three and a half times the force Navy pilots feel when they're being catapulted off an aircraft carrier's deck. And yeah. Decker held on for the touchdown. Okay. Could love your thoughts on helping us with our NFL playoff program page. This is for you. The NFL playoffs on CBS. String of Okay. So multiple. 
pounds of body weight. So is it any wonder that these athletes have so much protective equipment and have so many injuries and concussions and things with that amount of weight for that instant in time that can easily exceed the limits of, of those tissues in our bodies. Okay, so external contact forces, we went over gravity. That's the non-contact external. Uh, let's talk about uh, tangible external contact forces. Um, so ground reaction forces one. Okay, so this has a lot to do with Newton's third law. Okay, so we apply a force to an object or body such as the ground. Okay, the ground is an immovable object or body. The more force we apply to the ground, the more force applied back into our bodies. Okay, so equal and opposite. So ground reaction force is one, but it can be resolved into two components. Okay, so we have a perpendicular component and then also a parallel component. So the perpendicular component is the vertical part. Okay, so that's the part that acts vertically back uh, into our bodies if we're pushing straight down into the ground. So normal contact force. Uh, frictional force is parallel, so that's horizontal. So that acts between the surfaces in contact. So those two factors go into the overall uh, ground reaction force. So if we look at uh, just Basic scenario, someone taking a step, say jogging, okay, so they're pushing down and back, down and back with that step, so we have a reactive force that pushes their bodies up and forward. So we push down and back, and we have a normal contact force that pushes them up, and a frictional force that pushes them Forward. So the ground reaction force can be resolved into these two components. So what if we're just pushing straight down? Is there going to be any horizontal component? Is there going to be any frictional component? No. So the entire ground reaction force will just be the normal contact force. So a lot of it depends on the angle of force application, how much of the normal contact and how much of the frictional force we have. As soon as we have any horizontal force application, then we have a reactive force from uh, friction. So you look at these pictures and think about different scenarios in sports. Is there an ideal amount of friction that would apply across sports? Taking a look at these pictures, uh, yeah, exactly. So the amount of friction that's ideal for some sports, like is this the slalom? Something, yeah, I, it Sometimes slips my mind just one person. at the moment, but yeah, middle, yeah, it looks fun though, as long as you don't crack. Minimal friction, right? Okay, versus here, to guard somebody really well in the basketball, you want good shoes because that's good friction. You can um, cut and make the directional is necessary. With this, kind of depends on how much you want your players pushing against, right? <laughs> so if this coach wants more friction between the runners of the sled and the grass, what's he going to do? Stand on the sled, right? Or stack some plates on it. Um, so weight uh, is an important part of friction. So in most cases, the normal contact force, which is the perpendicular or vertical part, is going to be equal to an object weight. Because which way does weight act? It's act straight down, right? Which creates a reactive vertical force up. So we have different types of friction, static and limiting friction. So what do you think of when you think of static, just in a general sense? Static. Yeah, still, it's not moving. So can we have friction between object or bodies that aren't moving? Yeah. Versus dynamic friction would be friction between objects that, that are moving. 
So we have limiting friction in the middle. Limiting friction is defined as the maximal amount of static friction uh, just before the objects begin to slide. So if I was to push on this table, okay, it has static friction, but eventually, maybe not, maybe it's stuck in there, but if I was to produce enough force, eventually it would reach a threshold just before it starts to slide. And that would be limiting friction. So maximal static friction is limiting friction, and then dynamic friction is when an object is moving. So, key test question. Um, I'll ask you a question that relates to static versus dynamic. Static friction is always going to be greater than dynamic. So in other words, it's more difficult to start an object moving than it is to keep it moving. So these athletes that are pushing this sled, it's going to be more difficult to get that sled moving to begin with than it will be to, to keep it moving once they have it moving. So dynamic friction is always less than uh, static friction. Okay, so friction happens because of interaction between surfaces and contact. So the surfaces and contact have molecules with different characteristics and it's the interaction between those molecules that uh, creates friction. So just remember those definitions. Sometimes dynamic friction is called sliding friction or kinetic friction because it's moving. Okay, so two factors. How do we calculate friction? First one is the normal reaction force. So we could also call that the normal contact force. Or we could even call that an object's weight. So if I was to stack a whole bunch of books on this desk, that would make it more difficult to push, right? Because there'd be more friction between the bottom of this desk and, and the floor. So weight and normal reaction force or normal contact force, which is vertical, affects how much friction we have. Okay, the second part of friction has to do with the materials in contact. So this is represented by one of these Greek letters, and I'm not sure which one, does anybody know? This little Greek symbol, which one that is? You? <laughs> Yours guess is as good oh, as mine. <laughs> I know alpha because we use that for stats, but other than that, so anyway, this is called the coefficient of friction. So it's a number that in most circumstances is from zero to one. It's a unilist number, and it describes the characteristics of the surfaces in contact. So coefficient of friction, um, examples. So what does a weightlifter do to their hands just before um, initiating a lift? Right? Chalk, right? So that increases the, the coefficient of friction. So what does a skier oftentimes do to their skis just before they go skiing? To reduce the coefficient of friction? Well, yeah, to put wax on them. So we apply materials to objects in order to manipulate uh, the coefficient of friction to create more or less uh, friction. So here's your formula right here. So the subscript S or D uh, denoting static or uh, dynamic friction. Uh, the coefficient of friction there um, describes the relative roughness or smoothness of, of the surface uh, and then the normal contact force. So in most cases, uh, the normal contact force is equal to an object's weight. Um, so the normal reactive force, normal contact force, weight, that's, it's all uh, synonymous because it's, it's vertical. So that's made by the point here. Okay, so <clears throat> you might be thinking, well, how does surface area affect friction? If you think a greater surface area it increases the magnitude of interaction between the surfaces, so wouldn't that 
increase friction? Well, intuitively, you would think yes, uh, but actually it doesn't. It has to do with pressure. So the relationship between pressure and surface area is inverse. So as the surface area goes up, the pressure between the surfaces in contact goes down and vice versa. So a larger surface area means more molecules in contact, but the pressure is less. Less surface area means fewer molecules in contact, but the pressure is more. So it's kind of, it's a wash, basically. So surface area doesn't uh, affect friction due to that inverse uh, relationship. So it's, it's just the normal contact force and then the coefficient of friction, those two things. Okay, so practical problem, if you wanna just keep going on your class sheet for today. So the coefficient of static friction uh, between Jimmy's hand and his tennis racket is 0 0.45. So again, unitless number between 0 and 1, that's the coefficient of static friction. So his hand's not moving on the racket handle, so that's it's static, it's a grip. How hard must he squeeze the racket? So we're looking for the normal contact force or the normal reactive force perpendicular to the racket handle, that's, that's R, to exert a static frictional force of 200 newtons along the longitudinal axis of the racket. Okay, so setting this up, so we already know what friction is. Okay, so that's 200 newtons is equal to, what's the coefficient of friction? 0.45 multiplied by R is what we're looking for. So how do we solve for R? We divide 200 newtons by 0.45, and then you come up with the normal contact force. So it's just a simple algebra. Mm -hmm. Yep, it would be in newtons. In this case, it wouldn't be weight. So in, in this particular case, it wouldn't be weight because we're just, it's gripping, yeah. What'd you come up with? 400 and something, 444. So just round to the nearest whole number for these. So on an exam, if I want you to go like two significant digits or something, I'll, I'll let you know. But for these, just the nearest whole number. Okay, so we've got one more for today. So Marie is working in a shoe test lab. Would you like to have that job? <laughs> I didn't even know people did this. Measuring the coat, maybe I should do this. Measuring the coefficient of friction for tennis shoes on a variety of surfaces. It measures coefficient of friction for shoes. The shoes are pushed against a surface with a force of 400 newtons. So that's a vertical force, right? That's your, that's going to be your R. Okay, so that's the normal contact force, 400 newtons. And a sample of the surface material is then pulled out from under the shoe by a machine. The machine pulls with a force of 300 newtons just before the material begins to slide. So back to previous concept, just before the material begins to slide, what do we call that? Limiting. Yeah, limiting friction. It's the maximum amount of static friction. When the material is sliding, okay, so after it begins to move, the machine must pull with a force of only 200 newtons to keep the material moving. So you're looking for the coefficient uh, in each case. So you're given friction, it's gonna be 200 in the case of dynamic friction, 300 in the case of static friction with R is 400. So to solve Pretty simple, right? So to solve for the, the coefficient, you're gonna take 300 divided by 400, that'll give you the static. What's the static coefficient of friction? 300 divided by 400 is 0.75. Coefficient of dynamic friction is gonna be much less. So 200 divided by 400 is what? 0.5. Yeah, 0.5, so pretty simple. Okay, so that's the first half of chapter one. Do you have any questions?
anything at all. Okay. Know what weight is, know what a vector is, know how to calculate friction. Variables that go into friction. Okay, so we are going to be uh, starting on resolution of forces on Monday. Um, I do have a small assignment for you to complete over the weekend. Let me, um, I'll collect your papers in just a minute. Let me just pass this out. I'll make this available also under the assignments folder. So this is a, an interesting article um, from PDF about human testing. So what is the natural human tolerance to Gs? How many Gs of force can a human tolerate? That's what this article is. So this will be due on Monday. Make sure your name's on it. Just simple five points. Dissertation. I'll post the uh, video lecture from sometime tomorrow. Thank you. Hope you have a good rest of your day. Oh, okay. Yeah, I like every class. <laughs> <laughs>